Hi, welcome to episode 18 of Ask Us Anything. I am Mark Graben, a senior advisor with Kinexus. I want to welcome you to the broadcast today. We're also joined by CEO and co-founder Greg Jacobson. How are you, Greg? I'm doing great, Mark. How about yourself? We're doing all right. Uh, we haven't run out of questions yet, so that's a good thing. We encourage people to go ahead and submit more questions, and we will do more episodes. But we're going to tackle, uh, on the theme of Ask Us Anything, we've got a number of short questions in addition to the, the, the more involved questions about lean and continuous improvement. Um, so short answer question number one, Greg, what state did you grow up in? Texas, born and raised. Still I here. Was, I was born in Ohio, raised in Michigan, got to Texas as soon as I could, as, the expression, as the expression goes. Uh, but we've got a, a question it's going to have a longer answer that comes in from Tom out on the East Coast who wrote and he said at, at, at his children's hospital, uh, I'll, I'll read it in his words, I'm working with executive management to shift a Gemba activity from the current design to an approach closer to the intent and spirit of Gemba walks or visits. Their current, what they call workarounds, are better than traditional walkarounds. Walk are better than traditional management by walking around, which is kind of an old term, uh, but focus only on asking staff questions versus actual observing the process. Since we're only two years into our lean journey, an executive's observing can be potentially uncomfortable for both leaders and staff. How would you suggest starting out to avoid triggering that reaction? What granularity of process would you suggest observing something patient foot facing or not. So there's a lot of questions there. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll comment first that I agree with Tom that a Gemba visit is not just asking questions or open-ended questions or attending a huddle. A lot of the spirit of a Gemba walk involves observing the work being done. I've, I've seen uh, and coached executives to do this, to go and stand, for example, at a nurse's station and, and really stand and stay put and watch and observe for about half an hour. But I think Tom's right that this needs to be set up properly and communicate to people uh, about what's going on, why the executive is there, emphasizing that we're looking to improve systems and identify waste instead of blaming people. Now, I mean, that said, I mean, I think it's easier said than done. Um, I, I, I think at some point you've got to just start and it, it is a little bit uncomfortable, but the more you do it, you can build up a comfort level with people, especially if they see that the executive is observing problems, then asking questions, uh, being a servant leader when needed. And if things are getting resolved, that observation can be seen as a positive by staff over time. What are your thoughts, Greg? So, Kind of reading the lines and then reading in between the lines, I think that the the important thing here is to, to lead with why and uh, probably to frame this as a slight variation on something that's already occurred to see if you can make it better versus, hey, we're doing something different. We're doing something new because it doesn't sound like they're doing something terribly different and new. They're just taking a different flavor on what they've already done, which is getting out of their office and going to Gemba. Now, what they do obviously is going to have huge differences in the effect, but I think it might just be easier for people to say, hey, we're going to we're going to try this out. I think also this is where an, a simple iPhone video or a, you know, your Android video would just do wonders where you could, I mean, it doesn't have to look nice or anything, literally pull it out and in video a couple minutes of this going on and then wrapping that in a, in a quick wrapper and, and sending that to folks saying, hey, you know, Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so is coming, Gamble Walk, here's an example of this new activity we're doing in Gamble Walk and then kind of transitioning it. The, it's, what's interesting is, is I, you know, initially when I was thinking about this question, I was thinking, well, I don't do Gamble Walks in this kind of traditional manner. And so I'm gonna have a really hard time um, answering the question. And then I thought and reflected, well, in some ways I actually do do Gemba walks because oftentimes I'll just hop into someone's meeting without telling them and I'll just watch and listen. Half the time I'm just learning what they're doing versus trying to pick apart what they're doing. 
and sometimes they they'll be you know they'll put me on mute, uh, them on mute and say, do you need me for anything? I'm like, no, I just want to listen in because I don't know what you do during this meeting. And, and, and uh, you're talking about in the context of Kinexus, not in, in exactly in context of Kinexus. Work, the work you still do sometimes as an ER doc. Exactly. So 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 I, I really think that that the observing process is key, mostly from a standpoint of curiosity. I think if if the leaders go into it to under simply to understand what really goes on in a patient room in X, Y, and Z framework, or what goes on when a nurse goes to get a medication out of a um, medication dispensing unit, then I think that'll really frame the the action a lot better than, hey, we're going to observe to improve because it almost implies that you're not doing it well enough and you need to improve, even though we all know we all need to improve forever. I, I can give a unique answer though from the standpoint of being an ER doc. And uh, and as you know, Mark, I, I feel it's important that I continue to do ER work. And so I I still continue to do a couple of shifts a month. I would be I would be nervous and I've done this more than a dozen years out of residency now, but I would be a little nervous if my boss, so to speak, or my leader came in and was watching something where I was directly interacting with a patient. Mm -hmm. I would much rather them observe a non-patient activity right. first. And then once I felt comfortable with, oh, they're really not here to make you know, to, to evaluate me. They're really just there from a curiosity standpoint with the spirit of improving the, the work, then I would feel more comfortable. So it, it almost becomes less of a, a kind of a dog and pony show. I think if it's without a patient involved initially, then when that trust is built up, I think you can get into patient interactions, but, you know, nursing um, or even physicians, I mean, going back into like an ER doc, you know, after you see a patient, we go back into a doctor's room where all of the computers are and whatnot. That'd be a really easy place to to right. monitor. Watch a, a resident attending interaction would be really easy to monitor. Watch a physician nursing interaction. I think all those would be super simple to monitor in an emergency department. Not feel threatened. As soon as you walk into that into that patient room, though, I think that wouldn't be the way I would start. Right, I, I agree, and and there might be times when that's never necessary or appropriate to go observe in the patient room. I address this in my book, Lean Hospitals. There are a lot of times when I've helped people observe and we've carved out where, you know, space where we're observing all of the support processes around the, and leading up to the direct patient encounter. There are times when, um, you know, confidentiality, sensitivity, uh, privacy, dignity are required. And I think especially early on, process improvement opportunities tend to be of service, of service to the caregivers. Right. We want to improve the processes that prevent delays in getting you to that patient encounter, prevent delays that get the patient there, prevent delays in getting supplies and equipment there. There's a lot of waste that can be addressed around the patient encounter. And then at some point, hopefully the caregivers are feeling supported and inspired to more directly lead some of that uh, improvement work on their own. That's the, the other comment I would make. And having worked in a in academic environments for for much of my career, the the patient um, practitioner interaction changes quite a bit. The more people that are observing, it becomes yeah. a little bit more formalized. It's it's very easy when I walk in a room and say, "Hey, I've got a med student. You know, she's following me." This, do you mind if she sits in? Boom. We're the, the, um, ninety nine times out of hundred, they say, "Oh, no worries." And you're right into a, a very easy, normal interaction versus, um, hey, I've got five people that would like to watch um, and, and learn. Then it just it's, it feels very strained. So I don't know exactly if the the leaders are, are being shadowed by PI experts when they do their gimbal walks. I would imagine they would want to because in many ways it's the PI person kind of doing the gimba on the gimba I don't, of the gimba walk. Um, right. and, and then they can be there to coach and reflect afterwards and, and, and really give the leader, probably not in the moment, but after the moment, hey, it seemed like you weren't asking enough questions there or what were your thoughts here or how do you want to follow up on those? One of the things I know that there was there was more to this question because it got sent to us a couple of different ways is um, without a doubt, people are using Kinexus to help manage 
the the process I mean, you know where did the walk take place what occurred during the walk and then most importantly were there any action items to follow up on yeah i think that's that's where the the, the biggest benefit is um in, in creating those because you just you won't remember you know what needs to be done or what questions or what ois came about or whatnot so right fascinating question and uh yeah. And we, we could, I mean, well, maybe I'll write a blog post and invite you to contribute a little bit. Yeah, little great. Bit. great. Um, okay, another short answer question before more PI talk. Are you a vegan or a vegetarian? I mean, you know my love of barbecue, um, so I am neither. Mark? I'm an omnivore, but I'm, uh, I tell you what, I, I, <laughs> there, I, I appreciate a good vegan meal. So I try to mix it up a little bit. Um, when my wife li and I lived in San Antonio, we might go out for barbecue one day on the weekend. And then the next day there was a, a purely vegan restaurant in San Antonio, believe it or not, that, that we would go and enjoy. So I think if, it, if it's good and if it's interesting food, I, I, I can enjoy either. I, I understand people have different reasons for being vegan or vegetarian, but not me. So another PI question here. It's another fairly involved question about strategy deployment. Do you have any guidance or best practices to identify the most meaningful local metrics that align with high level metrics? I've encountered situations when people are not cooperative as they feel true quality indicators are subjective or beyond measure, or they're already measuring other things and are reluctant to change. I know engaging and leading employees is our responsibility as improvement leaders, but I'd like to know how I can improve this critical skill. Um, I mean, I'll answer the question and, and, and just say catch ball. You know, the key is this back and forth conversation of creating alignment around metrics. Um, we have your, your true north categories and strategy deployment. The organization might be looking at patient safety and measuring uh, something that rolls up across different parts of the organization, like the number of patient harm events. Different parts of the organization, inpatient, outpatient, might have uh, different instances or forms of patient harm that are relevant to them. So I think what doesn't work well is dictating the exact same metrics. Say everybody must measure falls because there might be some settings where patient falls is not the most critical patient safety measure. So I think the key is to have that back and forth. If something is proposed and people push back, don't label them as, as resistant or difficult. You've got to continue that catch ball conversation until you find that alignment. I, I think it's a it's an interesting question. One, I until I heard you kind of reflecting on it, and then I kind of put myself as the ER doc mm -hmm. in the question to, to see kind of where it would lead me. And one of the things I find very off-putting about a lot of the metrics that are and I'll say it, you know, shoved down our throats as ER doctors, is that they're shoved down our throats. And so I think if I would err on the side of allowing the departments to pick the metrics and then justify why those tie into the higher level metrics and then err on the side that says, you know what, if, if those are the metrics they feel contribute to the higher level metrics, if, if it's clearly wrong, then I, I mean, you shouldn't let people jump off a cliff. And I mean, you should say, hey, you know, you're about to jump off a cliff. There's just there's no right. relation A and B here. But if they put a, an articulate reason together, I think those people are going to be more concerned about the metrics that they have a stake in, that they help define than ones that are being told. And, and I think that's the major problem with the CMS metrics right now. There was 140 so odd metrics that were all kind of picked and at least in some of them from the emergency medicine standpoint are just, they're, they're nonsensical. Yeah. And so, um, and then applying it to Kinexus, Mark, you know, as our team has grown now, I let, um, I let sales pick their metrics and it's a catch ball. I mean, we, it's not like they pick it and that we don't have anything to talk about. It's almost like this, this constant conversation of, are these the right metrics and are we picking the right metrics and what are your goals for the year and are you challenging yourself enough or are you challenging yourself too much i mean they, they need to be smart goals right you don't want people to set themselves up for com complete failure um so so i that's what i that's what i yeah. have done from the standpoint of it kind of being shoved down my throat and then now from the standpoint of being a leader i, I really let the individual kind of divisions or departments put a lot of mm -hmm. stake in what they want to measure 
Yeah, I think one other thing I would add about making something meaningful, it's not just understanding and agreeing to the metric, but it's also a matter of understanding how your work influences the metric. Do people feel like they can do things that lead to improvement? And, and I think that's another test of relevance for the metric. Do you feel like you could actually do something that moves the needle on that metric to connect improvement work to um, goals and measures in true north? That's such a great, I think as soon as you put someone in a, in a situation where there's a disconnect from their work and the outcome, and then they're being judged in the outcome, it, it's just an immediate hopelessness. Yeah. And so, and I think it's, and it would only be appropriate to bring up the Spurs at one point in, in a conversation between us, Mark, it's, and I can't remember if it, if it was uh, Coach Popovich that, that mentioned this or where I read this recently, but one of the reasons why I think I, I, well, I mean, it's obvious one of the reasons why I like the Spurs is because they're so process driven. But yep. one of the reasons why I like being process driven is because we can control process. Sure. Right. Sure. But we can't always control outcome. And so I think that's such an important thing to realize that if you were coaching people on metrics, you know, sometimes it's just really hard to make people happy, for instance, in a, um, an emergency department. So kind of a satisfaction score might be really much more difficult than a, a door to doctor number where, where it's like, hey, that's, that's process driven. So let's see what we can do about that. And uh, um, anyway, just thoughts that come to mind. Yeah, good thoughts. Okay, um, another short answer question. What's the last concert you saw, Craig? Dead and Company in Austin on uh, December 2nd. Actually, went with several of the Kinexus team members. It was the first time they had been in Austin in almost 30 years. I couldn't believe that stat when I, when I read it. Obviously, they weren't Dead and Company 30 years ago. They were the Grateful Dead, but it right. was the yeah, also of the, I'm sorry? Surviving members who yeah. surviving members, correct. And they've added, it's amazing. They've added um oh my gosh, I'm blanking on his name right now. The pop singer who's a phenomenal guitarist who will come to me as soon as I stop thinking about it. But um he the very next day um ended up having appendicitis. So his uh the next concert in in it was probably developing appendicitis right up on the yeah, stage, yeah. actually, while we were watching. You John didn't Mayer. diagnose that from afar? No, no. John Mayer, by the way, is John the person. Mayer. John Mayer is a phenomenal guitarist and has basically replaced the the role of Jerry Garcia um, in in that rendition of the surviving members of the Grateful Dead. What about you, Mark? Last summer, I saw Willie Nelson uh, in December. It was part of... Um, the tour that included a bunch of other artists, including Cheryl Crow, was the other, I think, biggest name uh, performer. So I, I've seen Willie eight or nine times in the last 10 years. First time seeing Cheryl Crow. Um, so, yeah, that was there were a lot of other acts. Willie is still amazing. Yes. Yeah, he's still he's a classic. So. Back into PI talk, uh, another question here. What role can state and national organizations play in advancing lean healthcare initiatives? And this question actually came from Canada in a province there. Uh, is there an opportunity for nursing organizations and or unions that's being overlooked? Um, I'm gonna make a very general question and, and I, it might not be exactly what was being asked, but well, it's about unions. Um, you know, I, I think I've seen at least one case of a state nursing association that was being uh, putting out a lot of content that was very um, opposed to lean. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's unfortunate. And a lot of it, you know, I, I think it's, you know, there's a long history maybe there within that state. Most, I think there was a lack of trust between the nurses association and different hospital health system organizations, because most of the things that they were saying were critical of lean, they were really just criticizing management. And I think because there are issues there, anything being proposed by management, including lean, uh, was, was going to be reacted to negatively. I, I, I wish, and I have seen cases where different nursing or d other unions have been big proponents for lean, because when it comes down to it, um, the, the unions care about their members, their right. job security, 
their working conditions, their ability to uh, provide high quality care. I mean, I think those are all issues the union should be in support of. You know, um, you know General Motors and, and Toyota had a very successful joint venture at their NUMI plant in California. That was a UAW union facility. Um, and, and that factory was as lean as any. It had the right kind of culture of engaging people. And, um, you know, it was, you know, I, I, you know I, I wish conditions allowed, I'm not going to blame the unions, but I wish conditions allowed unions um, to, uh, to be proponents of lean. Um, I, I'm curious what some of your thoughts are. I'm thinking of this in kind of two ways. One, I, I think, and in, in Mark, you can probably spit out the acronyms better than I can, but there are a number of um, organizations. I guess they're talking about government organizations, but isn't there the one that I think the first Bush created way back in the day, NA, NHQ, I think is a government organization. Well, that, that's, a non that's private, National Association for Healthcare Quality okay. is a big component of lean. Um, uh, well, the Joint has come out in favor of lean a number of times. Uh, what would you say? I would say Baldridge came originally from kind of a, a government um, place as well. So I think there are some great examples. So I think you were thinking about the AHRQ. Thank you. That's exactly what I was thinking. I knew there was an acronym in there that I was going to mess up, but that was the one I was thinking about. And okay. so I think there are examples, at least in the United States, I, I don't know as much about in Canada um, but but what I'm thinking about, I think that I can contribute to the question that's more interesting is um, Daniel Pink's you know, book Drive. And so if if I was thinking of you know how would I motivate organizations and how would I create policy that would motivate organization, this is going to be you're going to have to really tap into organizations, if you will. I mean, I know that the book specifically talks about people, but I, I think it can apply to the the organism of, of an organization as well, their intrinsic motivation. So I think kind of rewarding the stick or the carrot in this situation is not going to work as well as just simply recognizing when people do good work and, um, and kind of talking about that story and making sure other people know about that story. So, so that's one thing I have in mind because I think whenever policies are created that are trying to change behavior that could be argued as um, – maybe a, a minority are doing, I, I think you're going to get into weird, you know, reward slash, um, you know, punishment kind of scenario. So I think recognition is going to be a key part of that. And then I think the other thing to think about is, and we were, I don't remember if we were emailing about it or talking about it recently, but when I started medical school in, in the, the mid nineties, evidence-based medicine was kind of a newish concept. People were just starting to talk about it. I mean, I, I remember that I had to have classes in it in med school to like understand what it was. Um, I would be really surprised if medical classes have evidence-based medicine curriculums now. I would just imagine it's just all embedded. I mean, everyone talks about papers now in evidence-based medicine principles, and right. it's just the way people are practicing medicine. I don't think we're 100% of the way there, but if we were 1% of the way there 20 years ago, we're 25% of the way there today. And, and that's what that's what lean is going to have to take the jump on. I mean, at one point, lean is going to have to stop becoming lean and is just going to have to be, this is the way we improve. This is what we do sure. when we come to work. We do our work and we improve our work. We happen to improve our work by using a bunch of principles that are all based in different lean tools and um, kind of different widgets for, for, the, for the problem. But it can't right. be that we're doing this program lean, if, if that makes any sense, Mark. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's go, let's squeeze in one more question here. A uh, short answer question, then a little bit longer one. Uh, what color belt are you? I assume this means in the context of Six Sigma or Lean Six Sigma, Greg. You didn't want me to tell you that I'm wearing a black belt right now. <laughs> Is that what? No. Um, we've talked about this. I I do not have a belt. I've never gone through any kind of belt certification. Um, I've uh, done everything, either learning through through talking or doing, or through through books and online videos, without a certificate in mind. So, yeah, Mark, I know your answer, but please, I I am not a certified belt. Uh, when I worked at Dell Computer almost twenty years ago, I went through uh, a Six Sigma Green Belt training class. I, I never got certified as a belt um, in my last manufacturing job at Honeywell. So I kind of have to say, well, sort of, I sort of have a belt, 
because they had a program there. Uh, it was essentially a lean black belt program. So they did Six Sigma black belt training, the exact equivalent program on the lean side of their lean and Six Sigma approach. They called it, and I hate the term, they called it lean expert. I am a certified lean expert. Um, I, you know, uh, so sort of, but I, I, I forget about that even sometimes because to me, what's important is learning and practicing lean. Right. And, and, and and more so than the formal belt credential, because lean doesn't really have a great tradition of, it doesn't have any tradition of doing those belts. If you hired someone outside of Toyota, like um, Jess Orr, who did the webinar for us last week, she's certified in something called Toyota Business Practices, which is their A3 improvement methodology, basically. She's not a certified belt. Toyota doesn't do belts, but they certainly teach people, educate them in uh, methods, including statistical methods. That, it doesn't seem like it's a, an environment or a area where it's required. I, I, just because I think you and I haven't done anything formal on the belt system isn't us saying we don't like that system. I think it's yeah. a very appropriate way to kind of articulate different levels and areas of expertise. Um, it, it just doesn't feel like it's something, for example, like being a lawyer or an engineer or a physician where you couldn't just become a physician today and, and not having gone through medical school and going through a residency. And it just, it, it creates a certain level of understanding. If you're walking into a room and, and you know someone's had these types of training, there's a, a level of trust being built up. But when you're bringing in lean expertise um, to your organization or developing it within, it's, you're going to have time to talk to the person. You're going to have time to research their past. And then you're going to interact with them and, and see what kind of uh, the person they are and their credentials in, in that manner versus um, kind of needing. So I, I, I'm happy that it exists, mm -hmm. um, but I don't think it's required to, to practice lean. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So then the last that was, PI, that, was a, that was a short answer. <laughs> right. Well, and, and there, there was actually more of a PI question than an ask us anything. So that's yeah. fine. But um, the last question comes in and says, we need to move our five S efforts, lean practice five S and auditing to a higher level, something that's effective and can help us advance five S and get more buy-in from production workers, supervisors, et cetera. Any creative proven suggestions that work. I'll suggest something I think is more proven than creative, and that's the idea of focusing on helping people do their jobs and focusing on effectiveness more so than cleanliness. If 5S seems like a silly initiative that's just about putting tape around everything and isn't helping people be more effective if it's not making their job easier, then I would suggest there's a need for a study and adjust in the plan, do, study, and adjust cycle. If people are pushing back and saying, hey, some of this seems silly, uh, I, I think there's an opportunity to uh, continue that conversation instead of forcing compliance. What yeah, do you think, Greg? I, I, I agree with you, Mark. I, I think in, in many ways, it's almost like if you can do a Jedi mind trick on, on people, so to speak. So. I would imagine that you know, doing gamble walks in a really good way could lead to people, if 5Sing is what's needed in an environment to, to take out waste, to get them to realize that, oh, there's actually a system, a, 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 some principles that have been kind of put in a relatively reasonable order that can allow you to come up with a more efficient workplace. But if a person doesn't think that they don't have an efficient workplace or that, right? I mean, if they, they think, hey, my, my, my workplace is already completely efficient, then you're going to have a hard time getting them to see value from right. the place. So, I mean, perhaps, so two things I was thinking about. One is finding the right leaders that kind of see that benefit. But then if you have or have identified a place that really could benefit from 5S, but they don't see the benefit, perhaps trying to connect them with a place that, has done some 5Sing, if you will, and mm -hmm. seen the benefit recently from it and, and having them kind of be the testimonial, if you will, I think would come from a lot better uh, place. So, Yep, I agree. Well, it's time to wrap up. Um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in and joining us. Uh, I want to uh, make a bit of a plug that our next 
presentation style webinar is being held next Monday, February 19th. Harry Kenworthy is going to be doing a webinar about uh, lean adoption strategies and what can be learned from work in uh, public school systems and how that can apply to people in other settings. Harry did a webinar for us back in 2016 about lean in government. And uh, there's, there's a lot, I mean, you know, lean is lean, lean leadership is lean leadership. So I hope people will go register at uh, kinexus.com slash webinars. But, but Mark, I, I don't understand. I mean, public schools aren't, aren't manufacturing facilities. Hey, students are not cars. Right. They students are not cars. Not cars. I, I mean, there, there's applicable lessons. I can't wait to hear. Yeah. So again, go to kinexus.com slash webinars. Stay uh, subscribed to our YouTube channel to get notified about that. Um, but we'll hope you come, uh, you'll come join us live on the 19th, you can ask questions, interact with uh, with Harry. So that's it for now. Greg, I'll give you the last word as always. I, I can't believe that we have, I mean, when you said, oh, last question, I thought, well, we just started, but we have successfully wasted, I mean, spent another half hour with everyone, hope everyone found value from it. And, and like always, I, I just, today is, the best day to start doing improvement if you're not doing it or to continue doing it if you're doing it. And best of luck. But keep spreading continuous improvement, everyone. All right. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Bye-bye.